Carl Hoffman will be signing books right after this, um, his presentation. Copies of his books are on sale over at the Prose and Politics booth. A uh, quick word about uh, buying books. Even though this is a free event and uh, we want to keep it that way, it does help if you buy a book here. So please go out and, uh, and, and do that. Uh, the more books we sell at our events, the more publishers will want to send their authors and here to speak with us. After purchasing books from our partners, Politics and Prose does benefit the local economy. It supports local jobs, supports our book festival. So if you enjoy this program and you're in a position to do so, please buy a book. So let's start the uh, introduction. I'm very, very honored today to, uh, to talk about Carl Hoffman. He's a author, lives in Washington, D.C., grew up in D.C. We were just chatting. We um, do the neighborhoods. My grandparents lived in the same neighborhood that uh, he lived in. Uh, Carl Hoffman is a contributing editor uh, at the National Geographic Traveler magazine and author of a great book called Savage Harvest. Um, it's a tale of cannibals, colonialism, and Michael Rockefeller's tragic quest for primitive art and his third book um, to date. His second book, The Lunatic Express, Discovering the World Via Its Most Dangerous Buses, Boats, Trains, and Planes. It was named one of the 10 best books in uh, 2010 by the Wall Street Journal and was on the New York Times summer reading pick. He has won four Lowell Thomas Awards from the Society of American Travel Writers Foundation and won North Thomas um, excuse me one second, and, and won North American Travel Journalism Award. A veteran journalist, a former contributing editor to Wired, he has traveled to more than 70 countries on assignment for Outside, Smithsonian, National Geographic Adventure, ESPN, The Magazine, The Wired, Men's Journal, Popular Mechanics, and many other publications. Again, he's a native of Washington, D.C., father of three children. One of the reasons that I was so interested in introducing him is that I've had a long association with National Geographic. And being much older, I actually went to the National Geographic uh, uh, events in DC and actually met Admiral Byrd, who had did a lot of work with the, uh, down in the Antarctic, if you remember. So I was very enthused to be able to beat somebody who also does a lot of those travels, goes down into all the countries, and writes interesting books. So without further ado, let me introduce the um, author that I'm in, in charge of, and that is Carl Hoffman. Thank you, Carl. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Everybody hear me all right? Um, it's a beautiful day. I'm so glad it's not raining. I was worried about that yesterday when it was pouring. Um, so my book is called Savage Harvest, and on the uh, face of it, it's a murder mystery about the disappearance of Michael Rock Rockefeller and how uh, doesn't it doesn't spoil the, the book to say how he was eaten by cannibals. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a bit sensationalist, uh, savages, savages, murder mystery. Um, and uh, there's plenty of that in the book, but really that is sort of a facade uh, uh, for much deeper things uh, that, that are going on in the book. Really, it's an exploration of, of, of what makes us human and culture, what human culture is, and uh, this sort of unending quest for uh, wholeness that we all have as individuals and how we are, you know, from the minute we're born and we're separated from our mothers, you know, we're always trying to deal with a sense of uh, aloneness and trying to get close to people and trying to, uh, you know, that's what love is all about. And, and I was thinking about all of these questions when I was trying to think of a title for the book. Um, and I had one, a working title, that uh, didn't seem appropriate. And uh, finally, I stumbled across a poem uh, one day, and uh, that just, it, 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 it captured the whole thing, and, and it's a pretty famous poem. I'm just going to tell you about half of it, which is, um, um, I crave your mouth, your voice, your hair. Silent and starving, I prowl through the streets. Bread does not nourish me. Dawn disrupts me. All day, I hunt for the liquid measure of your steps. 
and I, I, I hunger for your sleek laugh, your hands the color of a savage harvest, hunger for the pale stones of your fingernails. I want to eat you like a whole almond. And that is a, a super intense uh, love poem by Pablo Neruda. Um, but that goes to the very heart and the essence of what cannibalism is, which is a, uh, you know, extreme literal uh, need to, uh, to, to be close to something, to take somebody's power, to possess them. Um, and uh, that's really what's going on in this whole story about Michael Rockefeller. Uh, he was, uh, I don't know how many are familiar with, uh, with the story, he was 23 years old, just graduated from Harvard, uh, the son of Nelson Rockefeller, who was the governor of New York at the time. And uh, 1958, Nelson had opened the Museum of Primitive Art in New York, 1957. And that was the first museum in America dedicated to primitive art. Um, and Michael, he made Michael a, a trustee of the museum when Michael was only 19. And Michael was sort of brought up in the world of art like most American boys are brought up in baseball. And uh, after he got out of school, he went to New Guinea, to the highlands of New Guinea, on a, uh, on a film shoot that was uh, sp co-sponsored by Harvard University. He served as a sound technician. And he heard about these people living on the southwest coast, on the remote uh, coast of New Guinea. What was then Netherlands, New Guinea, is now part of Indonesian Papua, um, the western side of the island, not to be confused with the eastern, which is Papua New Guinea. And he heard about these people called the Azmat, and they were incredible carvers, and he was interested in their art. And he made a reconnaissance uh, voyage with a, a friend of his, uh, and the, uh, the, the Dutch government uh, gave him a Dutch a uh, an anthropologist named Rene Wassing to accompany him. And uh, he was completely taken and, uh, with the art, and he uh, collected some stuff, and he went back to the Highlands, finished the movie, went home briefly. And then he came back um, to New Guinea for a long, uh, what was supposed to be several months of going much deeper and collecting. And then he was crossing the river mouth, uh, uh, the mouth of a river, the Betch River, uh, November of 1961 when a wave swamped the uh, engine and the engine went out and they drifted for some time and then the boat flipped and uh, they drifted again and uh, after about 24 hours Michael uh, violated the first law of yachting which is never to leave a perfectly uh, a boat that's floating and he strapped a couple gasoline, empty gasoline tanks to his waist and uh, jumped in and said, I think I can make it. And Rene Wassing was older. He was in his 30s. Uh, he didn't feel, he wasn't as confident a swimmer. And he decided to stay, uh, uh, stay on the boat. And Michael said, I think I can make it and swam away. And he was never seen again. And uh, there was this huge uh, search and rescue effort. Nelson, the governor, and Michael's twin sister, Mary, uh, flew to uh, New Guinea immediately, and uh, there was this long, the, you know, the hel uh, helicopters from Australia were brought in, and PBY Catalinas, and ships, and uh, an exhaustive search was made, and no trace of Michael was ever found. And after a couple weeks, uh, Nelson went home, and uh, Nelson and Mary went home, and uh, Michael was presumed to have drowned, and and that's it, you know, 50 years passed. And uh, various, you know, if you Googled Michael Rockefeller before I started my book, I mean, there were a million hits and people speculated all kinds of things and they were Ripley's Believe It or Nots and, and uh, uh, you know, various shows. And someone wrote a book in 1972 called The Search for Michael Rockefeller. And all those things seemed very speculative. And there were, you know, every kind, like Amelia Earhart, every kind of, uh, 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 conspiracy theory about what, what might have happened to him. And I was long uh, fascinated by the story. I'd known about it for, for ever since I was about the same age and started traveling. And a couple of years ago, I started thinking about it again and, and reading what I could. And a few things stood out to me. Uh, one was that uh, the rumors were fairly consistent. The, there, were, there was one rumor that seemed to make sense to me. You know, the, the rumor that he was he abandoned his uh, wealthy, affluent life and wanted to live uh, with uh, a tribe just uh, uh, seemed to be absurd. And uh, but there was a rumor that he had made it to shore uh, and been killed by uh, some local men, and that even that it had been in retaliation for a Dutch. Uh, police government raid a few years before and but there was nothing more specific than that no dates no names no no, no nothing 
um, you know, nothing you could really go on or, or, or that seems specific. And I, uh, I thought about that and I thought, well, if there was a really a government raid, then there ought to be uh, documents that, that one could find. And at the same time in that, you know, over the last 30 years, I had become a journalist and I s went, I specialized in going to places all over the world, really, you know, weird places, Afghanistan, Congo, Sudan, um, you know, and I, I looked at those places as, as as real places full of real people that uh, were not just these sort of mythological alien realms, but places that you could go to and uh, with persistence and patience you could report from, uh, just like any other place. So I had this idea for the book, and I, uh, w you know, I've got a book contract, and I honestly I was a little nervous because I wasn't sure what I was going to find, or if I would find anything. Uh, that would be new. I couldn't imagine really that after 50 years, a uh, Rockefeller, uh, you know, that every, every corner hadn't been looked into. But because it had been uh, Netherlands, New Guinea, the area that he uh, disappeared in, I hired a researcher in Amsterdam and uh, sent him into the archives of the Dutch government um, and the Catholic Church. Um, and Slowly but surely, we started to find these documents, and uh, over a course of about a year and a half, we found hundreds of pages of documents that had never been seen before, and that uh, painted a really uh, remarkable story, and um, that was that, uh, 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 you know, the first documents that, that I sent him to find were about this Dutch raid, and sure enough, we found official government reports, uh, a man named Max Lepre, who had... Uh, his family had been living in uh, the Dutch East Indies. That's, w that's what the colony was called for 300 years. He was a, a, a you know, sort of extreme colonial guy. And he had a big chip on his shoulder. And he, um, he had become a Dutch patrol officer, which is sort of like a combination of a policeman and a, and a, and a government official. Um, and he had, uh, there had been a raid between these two villages. The, the, the Asmat, it's 10,000 square miles of swamp on the southwest coast of New Guinea. Um, and even today, there's not a, a road in 10,000 square miles. There's not a car. There's not a sidewalk. There is one cell tower and one grass airstrip. Um, and most of the villages have no power and no plumbing, no stores, um, nothing at all. And um, uh, the original culture, Asmat culture, was built on uh, constant inner village warfare and headhunting, and then an outgrowth of that of headhunting was uh, cannibalism. And they had the Asmat had been doing this with each other for you know millennia and thousands of years, and the Dutch had moved into uh, Papua in the late 1950s, even though it had been part of the colony for hundreds of years. And uh, the Dutch were trying to pacify the Asmat, and missionaries moved in, were trying to convert. You know, there's nothing worse than a cannibal. Um, so uh, uh, there were missionaries moving in, and, and um, uh, Max Lepre, in order to punish uh, these two villages, Omadasep and Ochnep, had gotten into a fight, and, 100 and about 112 people had been killed. Uh, and to, uh, uh, to teach them a lesson, now those are his exact words, uh, Max Lepre went to the village, and he uh, he was afraid. He says he was afraid. He was afraid of the Asmat, um, uh, these wild uh, men in feathers and uh, paint all over their bodies and with uh, spears and bows and arrows. And he went into the village, and he went with uh, a, a large party of armed uh, uh, soldiers, uh, policemen, and uh, uh, four boat canoe loads full of... Uh, tribes or warriors from an, a, an antagonistic village and you know every it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and everything uh, all, you know all, all hell broke loose and uh, he ended up opening fire and uh, killing five people and wounding a couple others so I found all those documents and and you know sure enough this really happened and then I found the accounts of two priests uh, two Dutch missionaries uh, Van Kessel and Von Pye and they had both been on the ground for uh, five or six years, they both spoke Asmat, the local language, fluently. And they had uh, gone on their rounds soon after, uh, my, after the search was over and uh, very quickly heard rumors that Michael had made it to shore and uh, been killed by the men from this one village, Ochenep. And they had investigated the case uh, quite thoroughly 
and uh, ultimately actually written these reports. I mean, reports that were so detailed uh, that they named names, who had Michael's skull, who had his femur, who had his tibia, um, uh, uh, you know, who drove the, the first spear through Michael. And they sent those, and I found all of those original reports, and they sent those reports to their superiors in the church and, uh, and the, the, the Dutch government, and uh, they were told to kept, keep silent. Uh, and again, we found all those documents. And so, um, and then I found out that the Dutch government had sent, uh, that even though the Dutch government had, uh, had denied that anything had happened to Michael other than just drowning, um, and uh, actually found the telegraph from the uh, Dutch ambassador to the United States home saying uh, Nelson Rockefeller's office has contacted us about rumors that he was, uh, that, that, that Michael made it sure and was killed because actually a Dutch priest, not the two, but another one had sent a letter to his parents back home in Holland saying, sort of telling this so somewhat sensationalized version of what happened. And the parents had let the, you know, sent the note out, wow, can you believe this? and uh, hit the Associated Press wires and all over the world. And that was in March of 1962 that uh, Michael had made it to shore and been killed. And so there's an, uh, a, a, a note in the files uh, to the home office in The Hague from the minister, from the Dutch uh, ambassador saying, you know, uh, the uh, Governor Rockefeller's office has contacted us and um, what can about these rumors, what can you tell us? And he gets a note from uh, Joseph Lunds, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, saying, yeah, we've heard these rumors and we've looked into them fully and um, uh, investigated them and uh, there's no truth to them. And then the next day, uh, the Associated Press carried reports that the Dutch had looked into it and then it was just a rumor. And in reality, uh, that very week, the Dutch government had took those reports seriously enough that it dispatched another uh, Dutch patrol officer, an, a man named Wim van de Waal, uh, to the village. So there are these three people who were really important, uh, von Pye, van Kessel, and van de Waal. And when I started looking around, not only did we find all these documents, but I found that uh, Van de Waal and Von Pye were still alive, and Kessel had died. Um, and so I went to talk to them, and they, uh, they were amazing, and they, had in, they were in great shape, and they had great memories. And you know, they would say, tell me things, that they wrote something, and that they got a reply back. And they didn't have any of these documents left, but we'd go back into the archives and look, and then we'd find uh, these dark documents that corroborated their stories. Um, and, uh, you know, after a while, it, it was sort of amazing. I couldn't believe what I had, but I was, uh, it was only part of the puzzle, really, because I still didn't really understand uh, why Michael had been killed, and I needed to go to the place and see it for myself. And so I had to go to Azmat, um, which I did. And Azmat is, uh, like I said, it's 10,000 square miles of swamp. It's very, very remote even today. It took me nine days to get there from Washington, D.C. You couldn't get any real information. I couldn't uh, arrange anything. You know, once I finally got to Agats, the main city, that's the, where there's the one cell tower in the, in the airport. Uh, you know, I found, it took me a while to find a translator, a guy who spoke English, and I found a guy with a boat. There's no roads, everything's by uh, rivers and uh, uh, small, you know, long boat. And, uh, and I hired them, and I didn't tell them what I was doing. I just said I was a writer and I was interested in Azmat and, and, and seeing Azmat. And could they take me out in the rivers for a while? And they said, uh, sure. So we, uh, off we went, and uh, we started. I really had a plan, though I had the, the, uh, uh, the maps, I had maps that Michael Rockefeller, showed Michael Rockefeller's journey, and I was sort of uh, going to the same villages that he had gone to. And uh, we went to a village called Basim. And uh, Basim was a uh, small, but it had a couple stores. And uh, we were staying in the schoolmaster's house um, and sitting on the floor. There was no furniture in an asthmat house. And uh, one night, there's no electricity, just candle light, and this older man walked in, and he was kind of wild looking. He had a big hole in his septum, and um, you know, this they uh, some of the uh, traditional asthmat wear these uh, bags over their uh, uh, necks, uh, and the bags full, you know, all decorated with cockatoo feathers, uh, sulfur crested cockatoo, and uh, seeds, and they're quite beautiful. And, uh, you know, his hair was kind of wild, and, and he was barefoot, and uh, he sat down, and he wanted the tobacco. They're all, 
you know, incredibly vociferous smokers. Um, and uh, everything, uh, every in social interchange takes place over tobacco and the sharing of tobacco. So we broke out the tobacco and we're talking. And Amatis was my translator. And Amatis said, uh, 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 finally, I, I said, to, oh, he said to me that uh, Kokai was the man's name. He said, Kokai is a, uh, he, he called him Bapa, father, and, um, which was a mark of respect. And, and uh, he said he was the head man of uh, Ochinep Pirien. And, and uh, the village of Ochinep was the one named in the original reports as having killed Michael. And it actually had split and become two villages, Ochinep and Pirien, but close to each other. Um, and sort of like, you know, Rockville and Gaithersburg. And um, uh, uh, so I, I, and I said, how old is he, are you? You know, how old is, is Kokai? And they, they talked a little bit, and Amata said, well, he, he's not sure how old he is, but he thinks he's in his 60s, early 60s. And I, so I said, for the first time, I said, well, does he remember uh, a Dutch raid uh, to the village? Um, and they talked, and immediately Kokai just started. The asthma are these incredible storytellers because you know if you need, if you want to hear a story, you got to tell a story. If you want to hear music, you got to sing a song or play the drums. And uh, so uh, Kokai just started imitating a bow and arrow and a spear and people's heads getting blown off. And I couldn't understand him. Um, and uh, but I heard uh, there were words that I recognized, and they were the names of people killed. In the original that were in the original reports, you know, Akon, Asim, Ipi, Faratsjam, uh, Samut, and um, you know, I knew those names just from these 55-year-old reports that had come out of Dutch archives, you know, 9,000 miles away, and here I was, in, in, you know, uh, in candlelight in the, in this Asmat village in the heat and the and the and the lightning and the horizon, and with this older man telling me the same stories that were in these archives, no leading questions at all, and the names, and the names were the same. And that was sort of a huge moment where I knew that this story was really coming together and that, um, you know, there was, r there was truth to these events. And that's how it went, and I started slowly working my way um, toward the village of Ochinep and, uh, and Omadasep. The, the, those were the two villages that had originally fought each other. And when I finally got to Ochinep, um, um, it, it, it was an diff incredibly difficult place. Um, it was sort of unlike any other villages. No stores, no uh, very uh, undeveloped, um, only nine plank houses. The rest were just these palm huts. And uh, people were very, they were not very forthcoming. It kind of was a place that made my hair kind of stand up. And I started, by this time I was asking more questions about, uh, not about Michael Rockefeller, I hadn't said one word about Michael to Amatis or anywhere el anyone else, but about the these uh, raid by the Dutch guy and about the battles beforehand, all this sort of backstory. And at first they were very forthcoming or, you know, they would, they were, they would come and, and sit around me and want to meet me and hear, but then they, they would clam up and, um, so eventually, I was uh, I was sort of my translator didn't speak English that well, and and uh, I was a little frustrated. So I went, I left the village, and I went to Aga, back to Agats, and I found another trans. I flew in another translator actually to help translate my translator, and we uh, piled in the boat. And this time, I said, "Well, I'm going to go uh, for longer." Uh, but Asmat uh, 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 is an incredibly difficult place. I mean, I've traveled all over the world, and Asmat was the hardest place I've ever been. It's incredibly. Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, there's no modernization at all. There's really no, it's a, there's the Asmat remain pure uh, subsistence hunter-gatherers. I mean, they eat sago, which is a, the pith of a palm from the, gathered from the jungle, and uh, small fish, and uh, shrimp, and sago worms, and, um, um, you know, there's no real reliable sor food source of food, and they're, uh, uh, these emotionally uh, full of sort of the leftover um, uh, the vestiges of cannibalism and the, 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 the psychology that led to it is this uh, sort of emotional extremes um, and you know it's incredibly hot and dirty and there's no furniture and they smoke all the time and um, you know every hour there feels like a day um, so I went back to the village and after four days um, uh, I just wasn't getting anywhere, really. Um, you know, they they refused to. By then, uh, um, 
well, finally, um, one day, uh, we were, I was trying to talk to them and uh, really not really getting anywhere. And uh, Matas said to me that night, he said, well, they're afraid. And I said, what are they afraid of? And he said, well, there was this American tourist that was, that, that was killed here. And I had never heard of an American tourist being killed in Azmat. I was surprised. And I said, well, who? You know, when? What was his name? And he told me a name. I didn't understand it. And after about four times, finally, he was like Michael Rockefeller. And I, I couldn't, because I never mentioned Michael Rockefeller's name. And he said, yes, Michael Rockefeller, he was here. He was killed by the men of Ochenup. Everybody in Asmat knows this. Uh, my father told to me when I was a little boy, uh, Amatsis was from a village called Biwarlao, which was nearby. And um, uh, he said, you know, they, they think that all the questions you're asking are leading up to, the, to a you asking about Michael Rockefeller, and they don't want to talk about this. And, you know, they're right. I mean, these were all the questions that were the backstory. And um, after four days, I mean, it was like the longest four days of my life, um, they were, uh, finally, when, when Amatis told me that I confess that, in fact, that's why I was there, was for Mike, because I wanted to find out what happened to Michael Rockefeller. And he's like, oh, we'll find out. Don't worry. I'll, you know, we'll get the, but in, in all our questioning, you know, they, they, the more we questioned, the more directly we questioned about Michael Rockefeller, the more they clammed up, and they didn't want to say anything. And then they stopped coming around, like they weren't even not, we were sitting there, and like you couldn't get anyone to talk to us. And um, finally, uh, and sometimes like people from the village would come and talk to Amatis or Willem, the guy, my boat captain, um, for a, I at night, and they would tell me stories. Uh, but nobody would sort of talk about it uh, to my face. And so uh, by then, two months was up. I'd lost about 15 pounds, and um, uh, my visa was running out. And uh, you know, I thought it was time to. I, I had to go home. So I, I went home and I started writing. I had the, all this doc, you know, archival evidence uh, that was uh, pretty amazing, and I had some good uh, scenery from Asmad and some good backstory. Um, so I started writing, and uh, after a couple months of writing, I uh, just suddenly stopped one day and I realized that I didn't know anything and that I didn't know anything about Asmad and I didn't understand them. I didn't understand it, what cannibalism was. And I didn't understand, um, uh, you know, I, I wasn't sure uh, that, the, that, that I was on the right track and that the problem was I had been to this village with this whole entourage of people. I mean, Amatis had, a, had an assistant, and then Will and the boat guy had an assistant. We had a cook, and the cook had an assistant. And then while I had a translator for the translator, so there was this big gang of us just descending on the village, and, you know, I didn't speak the language, and I didn't know what was being said. I didn't know how my questions were being translated. Um, and I realized that I was guilty of sort of the one of the largest journalistic sins, which was, uh, you know, parachuting into a place and just asking questions and not taking the time to get to know people and understand uh, the culture. And, you know, I wasn't just asking, uh, you know, who won the game last week, but I was asking, you know, about uh, the murder and consumption, cannibalism of a, of a, of somebody and that that was a pretty big deal and and um, you know asthma a lot of asthma culture is uh, secretive and and you know really super complex and um, so I decided that I needed to go back and that I need to go uh, much deeper and that I need to live in the village um, and that I need to go there alone uh, live there without any translators without Amatis so um, that part of Papua has been part of Indonesia since 1963, you know, 50 years more, and uh, everybody speaks Indonesian. So I found an a, a Indonesian woman um, who could teach me Indonesian, and uh, I started intensive working with her uh, every other day for a couple hours. And Indonesian is actually a relatively simple language, doesn't have many tenses. Um, and uh, I found an anthropologist and uh, who had written a book about cannibalism, and um, we uh, started spending a lot of time together, um, and I started. She sort of helped me understand things in a much deeper way. And seven months after leaving Asmat, I uh, climbed in the car. Uh, I, I, I climbed an airplane and flew back and um, arrived uh, back in Agats. And uh, Amatis was gone, but I don't know where you didn't even know where he was. I couldn't find him, but uh, Willem was there and. Uh, Willem didn't speak English, only uh, Amatis had, and suddenly I'm speaking to, uh, to Willem, and we're talking and everything, and he's like, Mr. Caro speaks Bahasa Indonesian, and I was like, yes, and I didn't speak it that well, but it was amazing, it was like this whole veil had been lifted, and uh, you know, it's one, one thing when you go to a place uh, one time, but when you return, it's, uh, 
it uh, makes all the difference in the world. And it turned out Kokai, I didn't know really have a plan for what I was going to do. I, be, I, needed to st I wanted to live with an elder. Um, and I've been thinking maybe Kokai. I, didn't, I just didn't know. It turned out Kokai was in Agas at the time. And I actually ran into him on the street. And he's, he did a double take. And he's like, what are you doing here? And I said, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, my son's here. And you know, we were talking. We were communicating, which I could never do before. And I said, well, I, 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 I want to come to Pirien. I want to kind of live with you for a month. And he said, sure. And um, so that's what he did. And I, uh, a couple days later, I got in, Kokai and I got in Willem's boat, and uh, we went back to uh, the village, and uh, I told Willem to come back in a month if he didn't hear from me, and otherwise I'd call him on the, s I had a satellite phone, and um, uh, Willem mm, drove away and left me totally alone in the village, and um, everything was different. Uh, profoundly different. You know, all the men, old men came around, they sat down with me, we broke out the tobacco, they patted me on the shoulder. And because I had sort of committed to live in the village and um, they treated me, you know, they sort of took uh, 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 possession of me, uh, took responsibility for me. And um, uh, I, I just resolved that I wouldn't ask any questions, nothing about Rock R Michael Rockefeller, nothing about anything for a while. And um, you know, it was super intense and it was difficult in a way. The first uh, days were very, very slow. Uh, you know, I was living in a house with about 20, 25 people and uh, they would come and go and, you know, they fell asleep at sometimes, there's no sense of time in Azmat, so sometimes they fall asleep at dusk and sometimes they stay up drumming and singing all night long and everybody wakes up about 4.45 in the morning and there's no beds, they just kind of wake up, sit up and then fall asleep when they're ready to go to sleep and the f there wasn't much food and, um, but uh, slowly but surely, I started to uh, understand uh, Indonesian a lot more and really be able to communicate with Kokai. And um, uh, you know, they, I was lucky because they were building a new Jew at JEU, which is a men's house uh, in the village. And there are these huge 20, tw I mean, what am I saying, 20, 120 uh, foot long uh, structures, not a nail in the place. They're really uh, miraculous. And they're the center of Azmat life and, uh, you know, like a church uh, and a city hall combined. Um, and uh, they were building. So uh, the building of one is a special time, a time of celebration. And uh, I was lucky in that. So they were working on it and drumming and singing almost constantly. I mean, it, literally, they would go for 24 hours a day sometimes. And Kokai told me that that drumming and singing was a bridge between them and the spirits, um, the spirit world. They're not, they're Catholics now, theoretically, but uh, you know, it's very hard to tell where Catholicism ends and traditional Asmat religion begins. And um, slowly, after about three weeks, I started asking uh, questions and asking much more specific questions. Uh, I wanted to know, for instance, who the men had been killed by Max Lepre were. Um, and it uh, turned out there were five Jews in Ochenep uh, at the time and still today in Ochenep and Pirien. And uh, so there was a head of each Jew, and that person, the Kapala Parang, Ka Kapala Adat, the, the, the head of it was the most important man. In the, and each, each Jew kind of represents a clan, and uh, that man would be the most important person in that clan, the most powerful person. And uh, Max Lepre, the Dutch colonial patrol officer, had killed four out of the five uh, Jew leaders. So four of the most um, important men in the whole village. And then I wanted to know who the men were who had been named in the uh, reports as having killed Michael and, and speared him and taken his bones, because those were uh, obviously s important ceremonial things. And it turned out they were related by blood um, to the men killed by Max Lepre, and they, were, they had actually taken over the uh, positions of, as head of the Jews. And there were many other questions about these incredible totem poles, uh, the art that they carved uh, that are um, promises to the dead to revenge their, uh, their death. And uh, Michael had found 17 still in the men's houses when he had gotten there. And they were, if the ceremonies were supposed to be over, they shouldn't have been there. And he tried to buy them, and he couldn't. He wasn't allowed to. And uh, so I found out about that. And I found out that uh, you know I had taken photos. Michael took many uh, thousands of beautiful black and white photos that are in the archives of the Metropolitan Museum of Art now. And I had photocopies of those photos, which I brought and showed to the village. And they had never seen photos of their relatives before, who some of who, you know, their parents, for instance, their mother or father, who had been dead 20, 30, 40 years. Um, but they recognized everybody in the photos, and they named who they were. And they each Jew looked the same to me, uh, but they would say, you know, that's 
Pirien, that's Ochnep, that's Yisar. And, um, and they, uh, they told me all kinds of incredible things, and I don't want to spoil the book um, totally, um, because uh, up until the very end, um, you know, uh, it was revealed to me some extraordinary things. Um, but, you know, I just want to stress that it was through living in the village that everything changed and having to, and plunging in much more deeply. And the book is really about uh, Azmat and this place, as well as this murder mystery and primitive art and all the complex things that were going on at the time. And um, it is a, uh, you know, not even counting my, my telling of it. I mean, it's a really fantastic uh wild story uh, and a sad story as well. Um, so I'm happy to uh, answer questions uh, and uh, books. Uh, I'm happy to sign books. They're for sale at the Politics and Prose Tent. So thank you. <laughs> Actually, you know what? If we have one more second, uh, uh, if I can find this, uh, my grasp of certain technology is somewhat limited here. But um, I'll play something for you. That's um, that's Kokai, and that's a love song. Believe it or not. <laughs> uh, okay, questions. It's a coincidence because that's my ringtone. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. That's the top forty Asmat song. So you know. Um, I was gonna say I really enjoyed your book. It was a blast, oh, and the whole time thanks. I was reading it, um, I was thinking of the Joshua Oppenheimer documentary, Act of Killing, where you're a journalist, and you're both uh, you're well, you're interloper, you're observer, and your friend in, in some instances, and how you reconcile that when you're dealing with people who have such a brutal history, such a violent history, such a history that's hard for us in the Western world to to grasp. And well, I mean, I think in, in, in certain ways, I mean, that's the essential, that's the, you know, your question goes to the essence of, you know, what it is to be a journalist and, and um, you know, and certainly in a long narrative uh, nonfiction writing that I do. And, you know, it's like the old Jal Janet Malcolm uh, quotes, you know, you're, you, 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 you know, the, the deeper you can go into a place and the, um, the more time you can spend, the more you get, but you can never forget that you're there for a purpose and the purpose is trying to, uh, you know, uh, unravel something, a story or the tr uh, an essential truth. And so, for me, you know, I feel like uh, it's always scary. I mean, that's really the essence also. It, it's hard for me to, it's, uh, you have to give up a lot to go live in a village for a month. I don't mean you give up your, you know, your, 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 your marriage or your house or something, but I mean, emotionally, it's very, uh, you have to give up a lot and surrender. You have to totally surrender and surrender control. Um, and I, you know, you can't really have any needs. You, c you can't worry about yourself. You just have to subsume yourself in, uh, in in the village and in village life and you know once you do that um, you know that's what I just do I don't know if I'm answering your question but I mean I just sort of do that and subsume myself in it and try to you know I, I don't know if I exactly become their friends and with asthmat it's a it's a it, you know culturally they're so different that uh, you know I know I never became one of them you know uh, Kokai called me Adik younger brother but uh, you know, I really wasn't one of them. So I just try to listen and, and never forget um, why I'm there, which is always trying to dig a little deeper and trying to put it all together into a larger whole. And this whole idea of, you know, that the brutal history of ASMAD, you know, it's crazy and it's wild, but it's also, uh, in many ways, it's less brutal than, you know, Western history. I mean, you know, 20 million people died defending the Soviet Union um, in World War II alone, uh, you know, and if the number of asthmat killed in intervillage warfare and cannibalism is, uh, f you know, a, a, a teeny tiny drop of that. Sorry, that's a long answer. 
How did researching the book change you, or did it at all? Well, I don't know that it r fundamentally changed me. I think it made me understand how, um, on the one hand, you know, w people are people, and we're all the same, and, and you know, there are all these fundamental human emotions that we share, rage, passion, jealousy, anger, love, and the need for intimacy. Um, but at the same time, I think spending time with Asmat made me understand how different, profoundly different we can be. And the Asmat have this uh, spiritual world um, that they see and hear and communicate with that we have no w access to at all. I mean, there's no doorway. You can't find the door to get into that place. And they're in it all the time. You know, they go in and out of it. And, and uh, you know, you can't, you can't see it. And that produces a, a fundamental, um, you know, we're in like two, we're like people standing next to each other, but we're in two totally different dimensions almost. Um, and I think that's, that to me, I that never leaves me. And that knowledge that, and I think that's, you know, true with so many you know, where we come from and how we're brought up and has profound um, effects on how we view the world and how we view situations. And uh, I, I think I'll never forget that. Mm -hmm. I, I heard another journalist speak a couple of weeks ago in uh, Los Angeles, and he talked about being in the Western Sahara and a photograph being willing to risk his life for. Did you ever feel that there was a possibility that you could die getting this story? Um, in not in Asmat. I, um, you know, like I said, they're Catholics now, and and they're kind of a wild people in a lot of ways, emotionally. But you know, there I didn't feel in danger myself. Um, you know, in the I, the days of warfare, uh, intervillage warfare, and and reciprocal violence are long gone in, in Asmat. So no, I didn't. I mean, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I, like I said, I get scared a lot when I do things like that. But it's a fear of being able to do the job and of being able to sort of let go enough and let go control enough to, you know, sort of um, uh, um, uh, and shoulder the emotional burden of of subsuming myself in an utterly foreign place. Um, but I never really get scared of, um, of uh, you know, bodily injury, very rarely. And, you know, that said, I mean, there are journalists who do crazy things. Um, you know, uh, Tim Hetherington, who was killed in Libya, and there's a French, 26-year-old uh, French photojournalist who just died in the uh, Central African Republic. And, you know, those people are really pushing the boundaries of what they're doing, and I'm not sure I would do that. And I don't, wouldn't say that what I do is as nearly as, as risky as what they do. I was just wondering if there is uh, some part of the story or is an element of resolution for the Rockefeller family that's come out of what you've done or through the years? Well, I would say there is a resolution. Um, the Rockefellers uh, won't admit that. Uh, they uh, never refuse to have anything. I mean, the Rockefeller's a big family. Mary's really the one that counts, Michael's twin sister, um, who suffered a lot by his disappearance and his death. And uh, I tried to communicate with her several different, uh, through several different avenues, including you know, writing directly to her. Um, and I never did. Uh, I've since, uh, just before the book came out, uh, we exchanged some notes. And uh, she did, a CBS Sunday Morning did a piece. Um, and uh, she agreed to appear on camera for that. Um, but other than that, you know, the Rockefellers really haven't talked about it. And they, they've been in sort of denial for 50 years, I mean, probably for I guess relatively good reasons. I mean, nobody likes to think of their relative being consumed by um, by anybody, uh, murdered and killed and eaten. But um, uh, you know, I think the Rockefellers uh, actually. I think even Mary now is coming to understand and believe that this is probably what happened to her brother. Does that give him a sense of re resolution? I don't know. You know, I feel like uh, I'm pretty sure what happened to him. Not pretty sure, I'm sure what happened to him. And I think, you know, if you read the book, you're, you'll feel the same way. So you might not, I don't know. Hi, um, when you were gaining access to as the ASMAT culture and the whole process of acculturation, how did that affect you, it not being an anthropologist, but being a journalist, how did that affect you? 
Well, I mean, you know, you're, it's just constantly challenging, really. And you know, and I, and I, I never had, I didn't even take an anthropology course in college. Um, but it was working with uh, Peggy Sanday, an anthropologist. Uh, you know, I started to understand things a lot deeper. I also uh, had a lot of issues with a lot of things anthropologists did and the way they looked at things. And you know, to me, you know, anthro I don't want. I don't know if there are any anthropologists here. I don't want to, you know, um, uh, um, put down an. I think there are things that, you know, social science tries to explain that are that's very difficult. Humans are really wacky, pe you know, really super crazy. And, you know, because we are, you know, we're driven by biology, but also with these intense minds that we have and imaginations. And, um, uh, you know, I started to feel like, um, uh, you know, that's the other thing that you asked me what, you know, what effect it has. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm utterly convinced now that, you know, the role of literature and poetry and um, that explains things, you know, human, the map of the human heart that, uh, you know, social science can never explain because you can never reconcile how someone could love somebody passionately and then kill them. For instance, you know, you kill your wife, you kill your children. Like, how, how does that, you know, how does that happen? You can't explain it really, but it's, you, you know, w we do things like that because we're so full of, uh, you know, em because of emotions, and emotions are really powerful. So, uh, you know, as a journalist, um, you know, it's sort of hard to, you know, on the one hand, I'm trying to explain these things, and there's no real way to explain them except um, um, by uh, explaining that some things are a little bit inexplicable and that human beings are just kind of kooky. I don't know if that answers your question or not. I think we have room for a couple more here. I see the two-minute uh, mark, if there's anyone else. You said that they, um, the men smoke? They do. Where did tobacco come from? Was Women smoke, too. The, the missionaries brought the tobacco in. Uh, yeah, okay. that's a you know, good technique. Well, they all smoked, too, in those days. So you know, they got them addicted to tobacco uh, very quickly. Uh, and it's a problem for a lot of asthmat because they don't have, there's, there's still not much of a cash economy there, so they uh, don't have, you know, and you got to buy the tobacco. I mean, there's not much tobacco. There's no tobacco grown there. Um, so, you know, they, they're jonesing all the time. They're in, like, remission, you know, con I mean, constantly. So when any time, like, a tourist or anyone comes up, they're like, you know, give me a smoke. Anyone else? Well, thank you all very, very much, and uh, don't hesitate to buy a book. Thank you.